Now, Shoreline Church, I hope and pray and trust that you feel the presence of the Spirit of God uh, wherever you are. Uh, I sure feel it here with the worship team, and it's a joy to uh, live stream this service wherever you are so that we can be in different places but together in worship. Uh, last summer, I'm an advanced planner, so last summer I did what I do every summer. I went away for about seven or eight days in northern Michigan, uh, and I spent time preparing the sermon series for this year, including our nights of worship. And I took input from our board members, our staff members, our pastors, uh, through praying through the year, and really worked and prepared. And when God inspired uh, this series for this year, uh, it's all about how, how the lives of other people can inspire us, how they can, how they can lift us up into who God wants us to be. And, and so uh, as we prepared uh, and as I looked at this series, Tonight's message was, was bold leadership leads to big results. And, and the reality that, that we're going to look today at uh, Peter and we're going to look at William Wilberforce and we're going to look at ourselves and say, can God use us to lead in bold ways? And I know some people listening right now are saying, well, I'm not really officially a leader. But let me tell you, you are. You're leading somebody. And the question is, are you leading them in a bold, godly way? Or are you abdicating that leadership? I stand here today shaped by people in my life who led boldly. My dad, uh, my dad, though not a follower of Jesus, modeled strength, integrity, honesty. I had somebody yesterday ask me a question nobody's asked me ever before. Somebody looked at me and they said, did either of your parents teach you how to behave if you're pulled over by a police officer? And I said, Absolutely. I said, my dad sat me down and said, when I got my license at 16, before I got my license, my dad said, if you, get, you hear the siren, you see the police lights, he said, you pull to the side of the road immediately, you put your hands at 10 and 2, you don't reach down to your pocket to get your license, you don't reach in your glove box to get your wallet, you go 10 and 2 and you don't move. Then my dad said, and then when the police officer comes, you wait, and when they're there, you roll down the window, there wasn't buttons then, it was a crank, you roll down the window and you say, good afternoon or good evening, officer. And if they say, do you know why I pulled you over? If you were going over the speed limit, you say, yes, I was going 13 miles an hour over the speed limit, your officer, and I'm very sorry. And, and my dad taught me how to respond if that moment came. Now, thankfully, that's never happened, except for maybe a few times. But, but when, my, when I was raising my three boys, I taught them the same things because bold leadership leads to big results. It makes a difference having a, a dad. My, my mom modeled hard work and diligence and discipline. When I became a Christian, these volunteer youth leaders who were college students modeled following Jesus. They gave me leadership in my life. I stand here today and you are where you are today because people boldly gave leadership in your life. And, and, and so tonight we're going to think about what it means to be a leader. The world needs leaders now. Christian denominations need leaders who stop bowing over and bending over and stand up for the, the cause of Jesus. Pastors need boldness in leadership. Parents need to be bold in leading their families and saying there are moral absolutes. There is right and wrong. The Bible is true. Christian parents need to be bold in their leadership. We need strong, bold leaders in politics, in education, in entertainment, in, in construction, in law, in every area of the world, in the military, wherever you are, we need bold leaderships, and it brings amazing results. And so our journey in 2020 brings us to this topic, and what we're doing with each, if you're guest, with us for the first time, each uh, first Wednesday of the month, we do three things in our sermons and nights of worship. First, we look at, we look at the, the issue that you know, a biblical character who modeled a God-honoring characteristic. We're going to look at one character, Peter, who modeled bold leadership. And then second, we look at a great person of faith who modeled the same characteristic, who's died, who's gone to be with Jesus. But some great person of faith through Christian history. And then we look at ourselves and say, how am I doing? God, can you inspire me? through this biblical character, through this brother or sister in Christ who's gone to be with Jesus but who lived out that, a life of faith, and then can you move me to be the kind of person you want me to be? And so we're going to look at Peter first. And we're going to look at four life lessons in leadership from the life of Peter. Here's the first one. Life leadership lesson number one. Lead out of a passionate love for Jesus. Whatever you do, wherever you are, wherever God puts you, 
whatever chance you have to influence others and give any leadership, let it flow out of a passionate love for Jesus. And Peter was passionate about Jesus. Peter was, was over the top passionate. Peter would at times be so passionate, he would respond. I mean, think about it. When Jesus is in the garden, drawing near the end of his life, and the crowd comes, led by Judas, to arrest Jesus, Peter responds, maybe a little more enthusiastic than he should have. This, this is what we read in John 18.10. You want to talk about passion and enthusiasm, you're going to find it here. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. It mentions his name. You get the picture. I mean, you want to talk about passionate. You want to talk about committed. You want to talk about, Jesus, I'm standing here for you. He pulls out the sword. And then what happens next, I, in my mind, I can only picture it in my mind as best I can, and it's almost humorous and sweet. I can see Peter pulls out the sword. He goes to defend Jesus, slices it off this guy's, we know it's his right ear. Flop, the ear falls on the ground. What does Jesus do? I have to picture it in my mind. I don't know exactly, but the, the picture is this. Jesus bends down, picks up the ear, puts it back on, heals it. It stays, it's healed. And you can almost hear him go, you know, Peter, settle down. Peter, appreciate the enthusiasm. But, but Peter was just, he was passionate. You read through the Gospels. Who was it who jumped out of the boat when Jesus was walking on the water? Lord, let me come to you. It was Peter. Who was it then when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, says, well, then Jesus, if, if you need to wash my feet, then wash all of me. And Jesus says, Peter, not all of you is dirty, just washing your feet. Appreciate the enthusiasm. But Peter was passionate. Who was it when he heard that Jesus had risen from the dead, who bolted up and ran to the tomb looking for his Lord, looking for his friend? It was Peter. If you're going to lead for Jesus, if you're going to lead well as a dad or a mom, as a grandpa or a grandma, as an aunt or an uncle, if you're going to lead well in your neighborhood, in, in, the sports, in the sports environment, as a coach, if you're going to lead well in the workplace, in any setting, let your leadership flow from a passion for Jesus. Love Jesus first. Seek his face. And if you're going to err in your walk with Jesus, would you err in being overly passionate and overly enthusiastic? God can deal with those things. He can heal ears back on again. He can fix those things. But walk in passion. That's lesson number one from the life of Peter. It's a great lesson to learn. Lesson number two. Life leadership lesson number two. Lead out of an imperfect but forgiven and restored life. Peter led all the years after Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and ascended to heaven. Peter led out of this awareness that he was passionate about Jesus, but he was broken. He was imperfect. He knew it. If you look in John chapter 18, verse 17, this is when, this is when uh, Peter has followed Jesus. Jesus has been arrested. He's going to go to trial. He's going to go to the cross. And Peter's staying close by. And somebody says in John 18, 17, aren't you one of this man's, Jesus' disciples too? Are you? She asked Peter, and he replied, I am not. Peter blew it. He met, not just once. Read the whole text. A second time, a third time. By the third time Peter denies Jesus, he says, I don't know the man. I swear I don't know Jesus. May I be cursed if I know this man. By the third, you, you read all four Gospels and you can hear it. By the third time, he says, may I be cursed if I even know Jesus. And at that moment, we don't, we don't know right away, but we learn in the text that Jesus is close enough to hear and see what happened. And so Jesus and, and Peter's eyes meet at that moment. And Peter's devastated. He's broken. He goes and he weeps bitterly. But after Jesus is raised from the dead, after he's alive again, he encounters Peter on the Sea of Galilee. And they have this conversation. And, and just a little part of it, in John 21, verse 15, we read this. John 21, 15. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, this is the resurrected Jesus Christ, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And if you read all of John uh, chapter 21, you realize that for each of the three times that, G that, that, that Peter said, I don't know him, I don't know the man, I swear, I don't know him, may be a curse. The three denials, he gets three chances to say, 
He loves Jesus. Hear this, and hear this clearly. Peter knew he was a restored sinner. He was a recipient of grace. He didn't have it all together. And neither do you, and neither do I. Peter led out of a deep awareness of the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. He didn't come with arrogance and pride. Look how good I am. He came with an awareness of his failings, but a deeper awareness of the grace of Jesus. If you want to lead well in your home, in the political world, in the military world, in the business world, in the educational world, understand that you come to that role as one who is broken and deeply needed a Savior, and you found that Savior in Jesus Christ and walk in that grace. Peter, life leadership lesson number three. Lead out of a Holy Spirit gifting. You find out how the Spirit of God has gifted you, has formed you, has shaped you, and has instilled within you a a, a gift, a, a charismata, a gift of grace for you to use for the glory of God and use that gift all the days of your life. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have come to the cross and received his grace and, and taken the hand of Jesus and he's the leader of your life, the spirit of the living God has placed in you at least one and oftentimes more than one unique spiritual gifting to be used for his glory. And, and Peter figured this out. If you read the Gospels up to this point, uh, before, before you get to the book of Acts, before the, before the ascension of Jesus, you don't get this, the sense that Peter's looking to be a preacher. But look what happens in Acts chapter 2, in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, that spirits coming in power, lives are being changed, people are prophesying and bringing the word of God. And, and he says, that you, you think they're drunk. They're not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And he goes on and he brings it, man. He preaches the word of God. He tells the story of God Almighty among his people. He began to step into this gifting that God had given him when the Holy Spirit came on him. If you and I want to lead well, we better quietly seek the face of God and say, God, what have you put in me? I've talked to so many Christians through the years who say, I don't really have a spiritual gift. I don't really have a way I can minister. I don't really have anything to offer. God's word is true from beginning to end, and God says you do. It's our job to seek the Spirit, to ask for wisdom from godly people, to maybe take a spiritual gifts test at our church and figure out how we're gifted and how God wants to use us. But, but you want to lead well, you lead out of your Holy Spirit-given gift. And then Peter, life leadership lesson number four. Lead out of your comfort zone. Lead beyond what you're comfortable doing. You want to lead boldly in our world, you're going to have to step in places you wouldn't step on your own. You're going to have to do things that that feel countercultural, that feel scary, that feel like, man, well, my tradition and my way of doing this is this, and I've I've learned to get kind of in this, this way of doing things that feels good to me. And there's times God's going to say, hey, step up, step out, follow me. And, and, And Peter learned that. In Acts chapter 10, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, go to Acts chapter 10. And in the story here, what's happening is, uh, this, this God-fearer, this man who fears God, but he's not Jewish of his background, who, he's been drawn by the Spirit. And, he, and, and there's this whole, you, you have to read the passage, but there's this kind of way that God speaks to Cornelius and to Peter, and he's bringing them together, and God's moving. So Peter finally comes, led by the Holy Spirit, and he comes to the house of Cornelius. It's not the house of a Jewish person. It's not the house of somebody who's a believer. And so Peter knows that he should not walk in that house. He should not be around those people. He should not partake of their food. That's how he was raised. That's what he understood. That's how he saw the world. Even though he'd met, even though he'd met Jesus, he still had some, of the, had some of those things broken down and torn down. And, and so in the interaction, in, in verse 27 of Acts chapter 10, we read this. While talking with him, while Peter's talking with Cornelius, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew, Peter was Jewish, for a a Jew to even associate 
with or visit a Gentile. We have no connection with these people, and we're certainly not going to walk into your home. Listen to this. But God has shown me, this was in a vision that Peter had had, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And they basically said, we want to know about Jesus. And he told them. And revival and a work of God hit that home and hit that town. If Peter would have stayed in his comfort zone, if, if Peter would have followed the norms and the standards and the expectations of his group of people that he was born and raised in. He would have never had that encounter. But he, he was willing to lead out of his comfort zone. I have learned as a pastor through the years that over and over and over again, God calls me beyond what I can do. God calls me past my own abilities, so I rely on him. And as a pastor and as a leader, one of my callings is in the name of Jesus to call other people outside their comfort zones and beyond what they think they can do. Because in those places where you step where you can't and where you step where you're afraid and where you step where you don't think that, that, that you can do it, that's where God can show up and sustain you and work through you and you see the power and the glory of God. That's what God wants to do. That's what bold leadership is about. If you stay in the safe places, you will never lead boldly for Jesus. Not in your home, not in your workplace, not in your neighborhood, not anywhere. Be willing to take risks and to step out. And so Peter is, is, our, is our biblical example of bold leadership. So as I was preparing uh, this, this, starting to work on the sermon about 13 months ago, I began praying, who is, who is a Christian in, in church history who had bold, strong leadership that, that would inspire us? And I thought of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was born in 1759. He began his career as a politician in 1780. If you do the math, that's 21 years later. Very young, he started, he started to serve. He ended up in, in British Parliament. He, he stepped into a life, and initially, he was not a follower of Jesus. He was, was a, little bit of a, a little bit of a wild card for a while, and then came to faith in Jesus Christ. William Wilberforce became a, a British politician, became a committed Christian, and I would say a reluctant leader. But what God called him to was probably the most uncomfortable and difficult thing to face at that time in the world. And that is that slavery was a national norm in the British Empire all over the world. And, and slavery was legal, it was normative, it was everywhere. And God Almighty called William Wilberforce to stand and fight against this evil. The idea that one human being would believe that they could own another human being, abuse another human being, treat another human being like, like cattle, like an animal, like, like a tool in a tool shed, and throw it away when they're done. He knew, once he met Jesus, that this was not God's will. You want to talk about like Peter stepped out of his comfort zone? William Wilberforce stepped out of anybody's comfort zone. He knew the cost would come as he stepped into this, but he stepped into it. I want to encourage you. I'm going to, I'm going to share four lessons from William, the, the life of William Wilberforce, four leadership lessons. But I want to encourage you to go on our Shoreline app, and there's a bunch of resources there, including a movie called Amazing Grace. It's the story of William, and it was, it was a, a kind of a Hollywood-done movie, but it stayed pretty close to his story. And it doesn't bring faith in as much as it could, but it still is a great movie. But you can watch that movie. There's some articles to read. I encourage you to learn more about this brother in faith in Jesus Christ, because he will in inspire you. But let me give you four lessons. Here's the first one. Life leadership lesson number one from William Wilberforce. Step into your calling young if you can and call others to do the same. Don't wait to step into what God has for you too late. Step in as early as you can. If you feel God's leading, maybe it's a leading into the marketplace and to shine the light of Jesus there. Maybe it's leading into education. But when you feel that calling, don't spend the next 5, 12, 15 years, I gotta figure out, if God's calling you, start to step into it. And watch what God does. God works through young people. When I was 15, I became a follower of Jesus. God called me to spend the rest of my life telling people about Jesus and helping other people learn to share their faith. At 15, I never doubted it. I never questioned it. I stepped into it. I'm not patting myself on the back. What I'm saying is, by the time I was 18, 19, 20, I was well down the road. Because once I knew, I jumped into it. And if you have kids or grandkids who have a sense of what their life's going to be about and it's a good God-honoring thing, cheer them on and inspire them. 
William Wilberforce, life le leadership lesson number two. Dare to stand with God against odds that seem insurmountable. Over time, hang in there. For William Wilberforce, he stood and he stood against slavery for years and for decades. He fought, he brought legislation, he debated, he prayed, he shared scriptures, he challenged people. He pointed out what seemed to be obvious and the evil of this practice, but it was year after year after year, and many times it seemed like it was not only not going forward, it felt like he was falling backwards. He kept pressing on why he was called by God. Dare to stand against all odds. When, when, when the, the hill seems too, you know, too steep to climb and, and the, the challenge seems insurmountable, keep pushing on. If God calls you to it, keep pushing on and keep pushing in. And one of the things that was wonderful about, about William Wilberforce was that, that in, on this journey, he, he got to see little steps along the way. He helped to form the, the Slave Trade Act of 1807. 20 years of hard work into that one piece of legislation. 20 years. Sometimes we do something for like four or five days and we go, I'm bored. I'm sick of it. I'm giving up. 20 years on one piece of legislation to begin to slowly stem the tide and change things. But he hung in there. We can do that. He was part of, part of what was called the Slave Abolition Act of 1833, which changed the slave trade in almost all of the British Empire. A lot of what happened happened after he died. But I believe that God lets us look on from heaven and cheer on those who follow us. And I believe he got to cheer on those who continued. He was part of that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about. Cheering on those who continue to fight against this evil. William Wilberforce, life leadership lesson number three. And this is, this is a challenging one. Carry as heavy a burden as you can with God's help. Spend your life carrying whatever burden God puts on you. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He didn't mean that it was easy. Light meant it fit right. When, when, when an ox had the right size yoke on, fitting in them well, they could carry a greater weight. I believe that most of us can carry a greater weight for Jesus than we imagine or dream. You know, I don't have time to help with things at the church. I don't have time for that. Carry, maybe, can I carry a little bit more for Jesus? Now, check this out. William Wilberforce was not just a, a pioneer in battling against the evils of slavery. He also was part of the Society for the Suppression of Vice in his culture. He was trying to change just kind of general evils in culture. He was actively involved in missionary work in sending missionaries to India. He was part of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He looked out for animals. And he had a lifelong passion of calling people to civility, to act in a civil manner. Could we use a little more civility in our world today? The answer is yes, in every environment, oftentimes including in ourselves. But when you see all the things he did in this, in this brief season of life on this earth, you realize that he carried a weight in the power of Jesus. Bold leaders carry a weight that challenges them. And then from William Wilberforce, life leadership lesson number four. Gather great mentors and listen to them. William Wilberforce, if you, if you study his life, he had a number of people in his life who invested in him, who challenged him, who kept him accountable, who cheered him on in the battles he was fighting and the work he was doing. One of them was a man by the name of John Newton, who we studied earlier this year in one of our nights of worship. John Newton, who was a slave trader, who became a follower of Jesus, and then stood against the slave trade. He's the one who wrote the, the song Amazing Grace. One, one of William Wilberforce's mentors was the man who wrote the words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind but now I see. What would it be like to have someone like that influencing your life? We need to find people who are further down the road than us in our journey of faith and ask them to help us. And I find the older I get, the harder it is to find people further down the road, but I'm always looking for those people. I have two people in my life right now who regularly pour into my life. They're both retired pastors who are 10 to 20 years older than me, and God uses them to keep me strong. They mentor me, they pour into my life, and I thank Jesus for that. So, Peter, an example of bold leadership. William Wilberforce, one of many examples through history of godly Christians who are bold leaders. What does it mean for us? Let me ask you some questions. And just 
Prepare your heart right now to listen and to ask yourself if there are ways you can step into a bolder place of leadership. Here's a question to ask yourself. Where is my God-given passion? Where is my God-given passion? Am I acting on that passion that God has put within me? You should be. And if you're not, step into it. Well, there's COVID and there's this, that. Yeah, the world's a crazy place right now, but find your way to live into your passion. Second, do I know my frailties are great and God's grace is greater? Do I live understanding that, yes, I mess up, yes, I sin, but God's grace is sufficient? So I will never say, I can't serve Jesus because I messed up, because that's true, nobody serves Jesus. We have to... We have to minister out of our brokenness and the wholeness that comes through faith in Jesus. Another question. What are my spirit-given gifts that I, and have I offered them back to God? How has God gifted me? And have I said, God, as long as I live, as long as I have breath, these gifts from you, I give back to you. How can I teach? How can I show compassion? How can I show mercy? How, how, how can I use any gift you've given for the glory of Jesus? and give those gifts back to God. I, I'll tell you one little story. In the season right now during COVID, where a lot of things are shut down, including right now a lot of activities in churches, our church has this hospitality center that's kind of been the land uh, that time forgot. It's just kind of been there since we moved in, and it has, we haven't had done much to it. But during this time, it's being renovated because one man in our church, a man named Alan Kuntz, who wouldn't want me mentioning his name and probably doesn't want to hear this, but he said, hey, while we have this time and nothing's going on, can I renovate and redo the kitchen? I'll just use my own time and do it. And it just so happened that Pebble Beach was doing some redos in some of their buildings and they had all these cabinets and they donated them to Shoreline for free. Now we have free cabinets and somebody who said, I will use my gifts, my ability to build my time to do this. And just today I found out that all the countertops, all the countertops for all the cabinets we had someone in our church who has a manufacturing company and they, they, they came out, they quoted, they gave a price and then once they gave the price, they came and said, and we'll pay for it, that's free too. There's people who are giving, who are working, who are serving out of their giftedness. When we start back on this campus, I'm hoping sooner than later, but we're back on this campus, you walk in the hospitality center and know the gifts of God's people unleash that in the power of Jesus. That's ministry, that's living for Jesus. Will you walk into that? Another question. What excuses need to be crushed? What are the excuses I'm making for why I can't lead boldly for Jesus? Well, people might not like me. I might get canceled. You know, I, I might have people frown at me. Or, or you know, if, if, if I am bold about Jesus, could there be some consequences? Well, Jesus ended up on a cross. He told us to take up the cross and follow him. So enough with excuses. Let's step into boldly living and leading for Jesus. And one more question. Ask yourself this. Who have I invited to mentor, inspire, and challenge me? My two mentors right now, when I was in Michigan, my two mentors were a man named John Shaw and a man named Warren Burgess. They poured into my life. I didn't ask them. They just came alongside of me and did it for me. But when I moved here, I didn't have uh, people like that around me. And so I went after a guy named Carl, and I went after a, a and, I, and I, well, I, I went after Carl, and I asked him to uh, pray about it. And he actually said, well, give me time to pray about it. And he came back and he said, I'd be honored. I'd be honored. And so I want to challenge you to go to people who you love and you respect and say, will you pour into my life? Will you encourage me in my faith? And if they say no, find someone else. But keep pushing till you find that person or those people who will pour into your life. I hope you feel inspired, not discouraged, not overwhelmed. I hope the life of Peter causes you to say, boy, this broken guy who was enthusiastic but made a lot of bad choices, God used him to be a great leader. This guy, William Wilderforce, who was kind of a party guy and kind of a wild man before he came to know Jesus, but he became a dynamic leader and God changed the world through him. What might God do through you and through me if we'll give our lives to him? Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. As we prepare to come to the table, as we prepare to remember that your body was broken, that your blood was shed, we ask, living God, that you will use us to give leadership to our friends who know you and those who don't. God, that you would use us to give leadership 
in our homes to children and grandchildren. That you would use us to give leadership in the military, in education, in real estate, in business, in law, in medicine, in politics, wherever you call us to be. We ask that you would use us for your glory. Make us bold in this world that needs bold leaders. And let the lives of people like Peter and William Wilberforce inspire our hearts to live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, I hope that you have some bread or crackers, some juice or wine or something to drink. If you don't, get them real quickly right now as I read the scriptures. Because we're going to take a moment and together as the body of Christ, scattered around our community, scattered around this country and probably scattered around the world. We probably have shoreline people all over the world right now who are part of this service. And let's come to the table together. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, gathered the table with his followers. Jesus took the cup. It was after supper. As he poured the cup, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus allowed his body to be broken. He allowed his blood to be shed. So I ask you to take the piece of bread, the cracker, whatever you have, and just take it and hold it in your hand for a moment. And just quiet your heart. And remember that his body was broken for you. That he took the beating, he took the cross, he took the shame. He took my sin and your sin on himself. And his body was broken to make you whole, to offer you grace. Let's partake of the bread together. I want to invite you to hold the cup. To remember that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful to wash away sins. That he willingly gave his life and shed his blood so that you would not have to come under the judgment that you and I deserve for our sins. Remember his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And let's partake together. Jesus, thank you for meeting us in this time and being with us in this place, wherever we are, in living rooms, in bedrooms, in hotel rooms, maybe parked on the side of a road somewhere, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are with us and that by your spirit you are leading us. And we pray as the bread is on our lips and as the drink is still fresh, that right now as we worship together, as we sing of your grace, as we sing of your payment for the price for our sins, meet us. Speak to us. Remind us that your grace is sufficient and fill us with power to live for you with new boldness. 